Thank you, Father. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you very, very much for coming. We're going to have everybody come into the chairs, but they're full, so stay seated. Uh, my name is Mark Postma. Just again, thank you for coming. Um, it's so great to see so many of you here. I want to say a few words before we get started about why we're here. Um, a number of years ago, uh, when I was studying at Franciscan University, I read a couple of catechetical documents. One was uh, both by John Paul II, one was a guide for catechists, and the other one was Catechese Tridende. Um, two phrases stuck out to me. One was in the Guide for Catechists, which was written for parishes and for dioceses. And he says, um, I'm going to quote it exactly, every apostolic activity which is not supported by properly trained persons is condemned to failure. Uh, a little bit earlier in his pontificate, he wrote the apostolic exhortation, Catechese Tridende. And in there he says the aim of catechesis is to not just put people in touch with Christ, but to put them into communion and intimacy with Christ. With those two instructions, uh, Michael Tolbert, you'll see him later, and myself started Catechetical Foundations um, as our response to the call for the new evangelization by focusing on a renewal in the training of Catechists. Authenticum fits in there. Um, to put people into communion and intimacy with Christ, first we have to start with ourselves. And we have to renew uh, our mind and heart to be awakened to all that is true, good, and beautiful. Um, these series are directed for that. The Authenticum series is going to start as a monthly lecture. We'll see where it goes from there. Um, Lord willing, it will go much bigger and much broader, but that's where we're going to start. We're going to use specific topics to help awaken the mind and the heart to all that is true, good, and beautiful mm -hmm. in this life, um, especially the life of the church. So we're going to start tonight with a uh, talk on Lepanto um, to prepare us for the Feast of the Holy Rosary on October 7th. Um, given the presentation, it's Dr. John Pinero, who's going to speak much more about it. And we're going to finish off with a little bit about Chesterton, who wrote a poem called Lepanto. And Mr. Steve Ayers is going to talk a little bit about that and then recite the poem Lepanto, which is a fantastic poem. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but to start, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. John Pinero. Uh, he's the Associate Professor of History and the Director of Catholic Studies at Aquinas College. He holds a PhD in History from the University of Tennessee. Uh, he co-edited Volume 12 of the Presidential Series of the Papers of George Washington, and he's the author of Manifest Ambition, James K. Polk and Mil Civil Military Relations During the Mexican War. Uh, consulting editor for the Polk Presidency at the University of Virginia's Miller Virginia's Miller Center of Public Affairs. His publications also include articles on the early American Republican academic journals. And I can't wait for this one because he has a new book coming out on the religious history of the Mexican-American War, published by Oxford. Is that correct? Okay, that's going to come out early in 2014. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Pinero. the temptation. Yeah, I couldn't resist that. Okay. It's times like this when I realize I need bifocals. It's about that time. Uh, gosh, I'm, I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm really happy uh, Mark, who is also an alum of Aquinas College, invited me to give a talk on the Battle of Lepanto, being that I'm an expert in American history. So, so, so this should be a lot of fun. <laughs> In our celebration of the Catholic imagination, tonight, and in particular the wonderful, or maybe I should say wonder-filled imagination of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. Uh, my role is, as I see it, is warm-up act to Steve Ayers, who's going to give you the, the poem Lepanto later. Uh, that is about the Battle of Lepanto, which was this epic naval clash on October 7th, 1571. So that's 442 years ago next week. Uh, the combatants were, I'm going to lower this a little bit. Thanks. The combatants were, on the one hand, the European and Catholic Holy League, organized by Pope Pius V and led by Don John of Austria, the bastard son of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and half-brother to Philip II of Spain. And on the other hand were the Turkish and Muslim Ottoman Empire, ruled by Selim II 
with a navy commanded by Ali Pasha. And I mentioned some of these names because when we get to the poem later, you're going to hear some of these. You're going to hear some of these again. And uh, so what I want to do is uh, setting this up is to give you a background to the battle, and it'll be quite a background. We'll take it back quite a ways and describe the battle itself and the outcome. And then I'll close with what what does this mean for the Mediterranean, for for Europe, for the Ottoman Empire, for Islam, for the Catholic Church and Christendom, really. Really, for the world, uh, I just finished reading a, an essay on Lepanto and Victor Davis Hanson's uh, something like Carnage and Culture. It's a, there's a, it's a book on a lot of different battles, and this was one of those in there, one of these epic battles of Western civilization. Uh, along the way, I hope to set up some of what you'll hear in Chesterton's poem. That is about the weakness of the French Valois kings, the religious warfare and religious protest that was going on in Germanic lands at the time the valiant heroism of Don John of Austria, and the astute leadership of Pope Pius. So where I'd like to start with the background is 1,100 years before the battle, and that is in 476, when Rome fell to the barbarians, which by the looks of the most of the people here, these were your, your ancestors. Those are the barbarians we're talking about. <laughs> the Greek Empire in the East continued, known as the Byzantine Empire, uh, with its capital, Constantinople, the new Rome, located at Byzantium. Less than two centuries later, Islam appeared on the Arabian Peninsula, and led by their founder, Muhammad, Arab Muslims conquered and united the tribes of Arabia before Muhammad's death in 632. Within a hundred years, a very dynamic Arab Muslim empire based in Damascus, have you, have you heard of Damascus? Yeah. Had conquered most of the Christian lands, including the Holy Land and North Africa, and had penetrated Western Europe through the Iberian Peninsula, only to be turned back in 732 by Charlemagne's granddad, Charles Martel. But from that time, Arab Muslims ruled all Iberia until 1139 when Catholic Portugal won its independence. In the meantime, what's going on in the East then? Well, in the meantime, the Byzantine Empire appealed for help from the Christian West. The Franks, especially, answered the call in the Crusades of the 11th and 12th centuries. What was their goal? Well, to free the Holy Land from the Muslim conquerors. They saw this as a more of a self-defense uh, in the Franks. As far as the Muslims were concerned, were these were barbarians hired by the civilized Byzantines. They were, they were mercenaries, really. They weren't quite sure who they were, in fact. Uh, well, by that time, the Byzantine Empire was pretty steadily on the decline, even before European crusaders and Venetians both, and these both figure in the poem later, sacked Constantinople in 1204 uh, during what was called the Fourth Crusade. By that time already, Bulgaria was gone from the Byzantine Empire. Serbia had seceded from the empire. Independent principalities were popping up within what had been the Byzantine Empire in places like Cyprus. So Byzantium just kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, picked apart by Serbians and Venetians and Sicilians. And it's around that time that the first of two waves of invading Turks conquered what by then was the second great Arab Muslim Empire. This one was the one based in Baghdad, probably the more famous uh, of the two. Uh, but for, for all those threats, then it, was, it really were, was the Turks that were the main threat to the Byzantine Empire, the Ottoman Turks by the 1300s. And the 1300s for Byzantium was a, was a century of civil war, it was a century of plague, it was a century of earthquakes. I mean, this place seemed ripe for invasion by the end of the 1300s, with the Turks slowly encircling Constantinople, conquering the Balkans, including the Serbians. And so, as uh, many of you probably know, in 1453, this is a key year for Western civilization. In April of 1453, the Turks laid siege to Constantinople, uh, penetrated the walls in May, uh, engaged in about three days of pillaging and plunder, which is about how long one would pillage and plunder a city in those days. I'd say that's about average. Uh, they enslaved the inhabitants, and they turned the Hagia Sophia into a mosque. Well, to Latin Christendom, if we move back west, the fall of Constantinople meant this. It meant 
250 years of warfare against the Ottoman Empire on both land and sea. Byzantium had been a, a buffer, whether the Western Europeans knew it or not, a buffer between the expanding Islamic empires and European Christendom uh, for centuries, and now that was gone. So when the Spanish in 1492 were able to unite and in 600 years of Arab Muslim rule in Iberia, the scene of the attempted Muslim conquest of Europe shifted entirely to the east, and now what became the buffer or the bulwark was the Kingdom of Hungary. And I, I keep hearing this rumor at Aquinas that we're going to have a Hungarian studies program or something. Is this, uh, so we have a several overseas programs, like the Rome Semester program, uh, for, for instance. But I, I think we have one coming up in Hungary. I keep hearing this. It must be true. Well, in 1526, Suleiman the Magnificent, the emperor of the Ottoman Empire, so named for King Solomon, Suleiman the Magnificent, and it was the Europeans, it was the Christians who had called him the Magnificent. Uh, some call him the Lawgiver. This is a very prominent, important emperor of the Ottoman Empire. Suleiman was able to subjugate Hungary. I'll tell you how a little while later, but able to subjugate Hungary using an army of 100,000 men against 25,000 Hungarians. So what we, what we know already from that is that the, the Ottoman Empire seemed unstoppable by this point. They're outnumbering their enemies four to one, and they're just marching, they're marching through uh, the, the center of Europe. Uh, they went on to attack Vienna, the home of Charles V, father to Don John. Uh, Charles V ruled much of Europe. He was emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And that brings us to the first siege of Vienna, one of the three important encounters between the Ottoman Empire and Christian Europe. Lepanto is the second. The second siege of Vienna is the third. I want to cover the first and the third, and then we'll come back to Lepanto which is our, is our main concern. Uh, but here's what happened at the first siege of Vienna. So the Ottoman army is on its way through southern Austria. Uh, the Austrians, the Viennese, out, out of Vienna, sent about 4,000 women and children out of the city, along with some elderly men. And what happens to them uh, is that they're slaughtered and impaled on stakes, and the young women are taken away as slaves to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire's armies then encircled Vienna, and laid waste to its hinterlands, and for 25 days bombarded the city, trying to get inside. But they couldn't seem to get inside. Suleiman was convinced, uh, in, in his own words, that God was not allowing him yet to conquer Vienna. So he decided to up and leave, and in the middle of the night, one night, uh, those in Vienna awoke to screams outside the walls. And what was happening was that the the Turks were burning all the baggage they couldn't carry, and that included their prisoners, and they were burning them alive. Um, I tell you some of these stories not to point out some kind of unique penchant for the Turks for atrocity, because there's a lot of that to go around, but it'll explain some of what happens later at Lepanto, uh, because as you may know in warfare, there's usually tit for tat, and atrocity follows atrocity. Uh, we're we're going to see that later, too. In the meantime, so we're in the 1500s, right? This is a pretty important century for Christianity in Europe. Uh, Martin Luther had already started his Reformation, uh, and things were moving ahead on that in Germany. So in the meantime, the Ottoman Empire was very aggressive at trying to destabilize Europe and destroy the Catholic Church. And so when uh, Christianity split into Protestant, Protestant states, is how it would work at the time in Catholic states, uh, guess what? You're now a Protestant if your prince is Protestant, unless you fight. This is how it was going to work in the Holy Roman Empire. So they were going to be fighting about this for, for decades, and then on into the 1600s even. Um, so the Ottoman Empire is pouring money into Protestant states in order to make sure Europe remained divided politically and religiously, make it right for invasion and, and conquest, right? You, wanted to, you want your enemy to be divided and at war with itself, uh, for lots of reasons, but those wars are really expensive, too. I mean, that's, that's, that's certainly one of the reasons. The other thing the Ottoman Empire did was make an alliance with the king of the kingdom, once lauded as the eldest daughter of the church, uh, the kingdom that had uh, led the way in the Crusades beginning in 1096, and that's France. And so you, know, you want to listen for Chesterton's opinion of France in the 1500s later, it's not going to be good. I hate to, did I give that away? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you want to hear that in the, in the poem later. 
It's actually that alliance that uh, sold out Hungary to the Ottoman Empire. And this reminds me, I'm almost to uh, World War II in my American history class, and it's not going to be, it's not the last time that's going to happen. I was in Western Europeans uh, selling out some Eastern Europeans. Well, the third important encounter, I said I'd do the third, the second siege of Vienna didn't happen until 1683. So if you can imagine a people patient and self-aware enough to spend all that time between the 1520s and the 1680s building up their walls, fortifying their city, uh, that's what Vienna's doing. Uh, really, this, this battle, and I wanted to mention it for this reason, is it more important than Lepanto in cracking the armor of the Ottoman Empire and making uh, European Christians realize that the Ottoman Empire was not invincible. I don't know that there's a poem about the second siege of Vienna. There, there may be. If there is, Leonard will tell me about it later. No. This was a German and Austrian army against the Turks. The Turkish army once again couldn't be, breach the new barricades. There was a long, hard siege, and I guess it's appropriate, since we're on the verge of Pulaski days here, to say that what saves the day here is the arrival of the Polish cavalry. Uh, almost like you, you would now put it into a movie and you would say those kinds of things don't happen, but guess what? It did happen. I mean, this is, this is the last minute. It's Gandalf coming over the hill, and there you go. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and they saved the day. I thought you might get that reference. <laughs> So the Ottomans had come extremely close to controlling Europe, but that's as close as they're ever going to get. That's 1683. The empire declined from there until by the 1800s and early 1900s. It had become known as the sick man of Europe. Dangerous not because of its strength, but because of its weakness. But again, it's the second of these three encounters. Uh, the one in the middle of the two sieges of Vienna, that's our main concern tonight, and that's the Battle of Lepanto. So here's your problem if you're the Ottoman Empire at the time. You control the trade routes to Asia, which the Europeans had coveted from time immemorial, the overland routes, the Silk Road, etc. But now the Europeans, beginning with the Portuguese in the 1400s and later others doing that by the 1500s, uh, now the Europeans have begun to sail around your empire. They're cutting out you, the middlemen, and you know what middlemen do? They, they take something these people make and they, get, they sell it to these people over here, and the price doesn't remain the same, right? So the, the Ottoman Empire is missing out on this. The Turks see this also as a sign of the future. That is a future naval dominance by the Christian West, and they know that if they can't break out of the, the, the Mediterranean Sea and get out into the Atlantic, uh, then their empire is in trouble. So they could, they could only avoid that fate, which is clear to them to see, and people used to think more long-term back then, so that's how they're thinking. They could avoid that by keeping the Europeans tied up in expensive wars, and they're doing that, and then by breaking out of the Mediterranean Sea. And so it began Ottoman expansion into the Mediterranean, into islands and areas claimed by Venice, by Spain, by Sicily, and others. And so here Christendom is divided. It's the 1500s, and the Ottoman Empire appears nothing but strong and expansive. Even after being turned back at Vienna, it's really on the move there in the Mediterranean. So except for the first siege of Vienna, there's no defeat of the Turks at European hands up to this point. There's this rumor of invincibility. And, you know, when the other army just gets up and leaves, you kind of wonder if it really is a defeat. Well, in 1656... After successfully, 1556, after successfully taking the island of Rhodes, the Ottomans tried to invade Malta and they failed. So in 1570, they invaded Cyprus instead. And in some ways, what Lepanto is really about uh, is about Cyprus. The Europeans, however, and the Pope were going to think it's really about Rome and an invasion of Italy. So Cyprus was controlled by Venice. Venice was. Uh, the Italian peninsula was simply a peninsula with people who spoke all different dialects of Italian. There was certainly not one, there was not one Italy, right? And one of the most powerful city-states, really the most powerful city-state on the peninsula, uh, was, was Venice. Uh, and they traded around the Mediterranean and had colonies around the Mediterranean and controlled islands around the Mediterranean. Uh, well, when Cyprus was invaded and taken away from, from Venice, uh, its ruler was torn apart with hooks while he was still alive to make a spectacle of him. And this is their way of saying, hey, uh, if we come knocking at your door, why don't you just let us in and avoid this fate? Don't, don't resist. The next year, 
the next year, the empire began raiding islands controlled by Venice in the Adriatic. So they are getting, they're getting closer. It's obvious to the Pope, Pope Pius V, now Pope St. Pius V, uh, that Italy was next. And Pius V was a busy guy, right? He's the one instituting the reforms of the Council of Trent and putting together a new missal. I mean, he's, he's very busy with other things, but he also is ruler of the Papal States in the center of, of Italy. And he recognizes that there's, there's two threats he sees to Christendom. There's the Protestant threat from the north, and there's the Ottoman threat from, from the east. And the Tridentine reforms, he think, can take care of the, the Protestant threat, as he saw it. The Ottoman threat, though, um, it'd be hard to tackle that with a, with a missile. M-I-S-S-A-L. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if Christendom doesn't crumble from within, it might well be conquered from without. So Pius worked to put together an alliance, a league, to stop the Ottoman advance. The Italians are in it. The Spanish, who were barely a generation out from being under Muslim rule and still had a, a crusader uh, uh, mentality, joined. And thanks to the first siege of Vienna, of course, the Austrians understood the gravity of the threat, too. Uh, but what about the French? Well, the French Valois kings had treated with the Ottomans and were wrapped up in their own conflicts, religious and otherwise. This was the year of the St. Bartholomew's massacre as well as the year of Henry IV. If you know anything about Henry IV, you know he changed his religion several times before deciding that being the king of France was worth the trouble of being Catholic. Or, or in his words, Paris is worth a mass. <laughs> I mean, that's not an untrue statement on his part, because <laughs> Paris is worth a mass. But, uh, uh, so, by 1571, it's Charles IX, he's king of France, but it's his mother, Catherine de Medici, He's actually ruling the country. Charles tried to stop Pius's efforts at forming the League. There were a lot of fears that this would become a new, a new alliance. What would it be used for? There's only so much glory and power and authority to go around. So there's fear across the face of the Holy Roman Empire, Germany that is. Lutheran princes were fighting Catholic knights. So you have the King of France trying to stop the Holy League. Charles V, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, isn't so sure. Uh, he's nervous, and in particular, Philip II of Spain is very nervous of his half-brother and jealous. And some of you may know the rumors that it's, it's perhaps Philip who ended up killing Don John uh, later on by poisoning him. There's not much proof of that, but there is proof that he poisoned his secretary. So if you... I've never been allowed on a jury before, so I wouldn't know what to make of that. They think professors are, I don't know, if they're too smart or something to be on a jury. It's probably the opposite. It's what they're, what they're afraid of, I'm not sure. Meanwhile, what's going on in England? Well, the daughter of the union between Henry VIII and his mistress Anne Boleyn Elizabeth was queen of England, and her long rule saw priests chased into holes, executed for saying mass, and the penal laws placed on the Catholics of Ireland. Spain had become the villain under Elizabeth as she faced down Philip II, who had styled himself defender of the Catholic faith. Uh, so you look at a continent like this, and you're Selim II, you're the ruler of the Ottoman Empire, and you think a divided warring continent like this shouldn't be too hard to conquer. And that's exactly, I think, what Selim II uh, was saying, was thinking when he ordered Ali Pasha in his navy past Greece and, and toward Italy. Uh, but in this case, what they found, I think, is that appearances can be deceptive and, and heroes can be real. And recognizing the threat, Pius formed the Holy League on March 7th, 1571. Uh, in those days, the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. So again, the League included Spain, Venice, and the Papal States, which Pius himself ruled. For the next several months, the Pope called for prayer and fasting in Rome, public devotions, the praying of the rosary. Uh, and the prayer was that Rome and Christendom might be spared from the Turks. The prayer wasn't, I think, for, uh, it was going to take bloodletting, but there's, there's different ways you can pray a prayer like that, I think, and that's what he said, just, you know, spare us, whatever that's going to take. Importantly, it was Pius who commended reliance on the Virgin Mary and on the Holy Rosary in particular for this. So every soldier 
and every slave rowing the galleys of some of the Venetian ships got a rosary. The slaves got their freedom if they were victorious. Nobody was threatened with, with death. Uh, Hansen in his book points out that there was not one free member of the Turkish Navy. Not the Janissaries, not the Christian slaves who rode below, not even Ali Pasha really. You, you lose, you're in pretty bad shape. Um, all these, all these on, the, uh, on the side of the Holy League, as it was called, also received a plenary indulgence. Uh, but Pius didn't rely on prayer alone. Uh, there would, as one writer put it, be a spiritual plan of attack and a physical plan of attack, uh, which uh, reminds me of something I heard your, your pastor here, uh, Father Sirico, say when he talks about the need for piety and technique. Uh, Pius V understood that truth. The technique in this case was a massive armada of ships and cannon uh, heading towards the Ottoman Empire <laughs> at the Pope's urging. Now it's the Pope who wanted Don John of Austria to lead this fleet against the wishes of Philip II, and he's successful. So Don John of Austria becomes commander of the fleet. Don John was level-headed. He was not riven by the usual petty jealousies of nobility in, in those days. And he was truly more concerned about saving Europe than anything else. I was preparing for this talk, and I kept thinking I would come away less impressed, which is usually what happens when you study a historical person. The deeper you get into them, maybe the less impressed you are. But the other way of looking at that, at least for me as a Catholic, is then I start getting impressed with their, their accomplishments. Like, well, they can accomplish that despite those vices and those troubles and those, those difficulties. And I guess there's two different ways to look at that. But with Don John, he kept getting uh, more impressive uh, and then I found out he was 24 at the time. So, I don't know what you were doing uh, when you were 24. Bob, I, know, I don't want to know, Dr. Marco, uh, what you were doing, but uh, uh, I guess if Don John was American and, and alive today, he could stay on Charles V's health insurance for another couple of years. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't say that, and I even with the camera on. Don John's ship flew a banner with a large cross on it. Ali Pasha flew a banner with Quranic verses in the name of Allah written on it in calligraphy nearly 29,000 times in gold calligraphy, rumored to be a banner that Muhammad himself had, uh, had carried. Uh, so there's, whenever you read a history that might try to turn this, this battle into an economic battle with religion having nothing to do with it, uh, you just have to think about what these flagships are. And they're not supposed to go at each other during the battle. That's exactly, that's exactly what they do. Both sides go directly for each other. Well, the Spanish part of the fleet carried a replica of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And it also carried a young soldier by the name of Cervantes, uh, who was uh, still nursing grievances, I think, because he had been a hostage of the Barbary pirates. So both navies engaged on October 7th, 1571, as the Romans prayed the rosary at the behest of Pius V, who of course didn't yet know that the two navies had even met in battle, uh, and they fought off the Greek coast near a town called Lepanto. The Christian fleet had about 30,000 fighting men on board and some slaves rowing the Venetian ships. The number, just to give you the numbers, 203 galleys. Mostly, most of them are contributed by Naples and Sicily, but many by Spain and Venice, but it's really Venice that flipped the bill, most of the bill for this, followed by the Papal States of Pius V. Uh, there were a few ships sent by the Pope, but the Pope was, he was funding the thing for the most part. So this was the largest fleet ever in European waters up till that time. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, 208 galleys, 208 ships, so fairly evenly matched in numbers, about 25,000 men, plus probably twice that in Christian slaves beneath the decks rowing. The Ottomans were sure after this that some of the Christians maybe just stopped rowing and uh, martyred themselves. It's difficult to know that. Um, uh, you know, they're down there being whipped till they, till they row, right? So it's, it's hard to say. Uh, we, we, we can't know that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if Chesterton comments on that in the poem, but we'll find out, Steve, in just a few minutes. The payment of the Ottoman bill came from the confiscation of church lands as part of an orchestrated attempt to destroy the Orthodox Church in, in Ottoman lands. Um, the battle began with the Christian fleet heading into the wind, which, uh, you know, I'm not that familiar with naval battles, but I do know that's not where you want to be. But suddenly the wind shifted. 
It's kind of a good pause for effect anyway. <laughs> Suddenly the wind shifted, pushed the Holy League uh, fleet towards the Ottoman fleet, and then it calmed, and in the calm waters, the Holy League proceeded to decimate the Ottoman fleet. At about this time in Rome, amid public processions and prayers and fasting, uh, the legend is that Pius V had a vision of victory. Uh, there, are, there are several reasons that I, as an historian, can, can account for uh, in the Holy League's success and why the fleet of Don John of Austria won the day uh, in 1571 on October 7th. Uh, Europeans had far superior cannon mounted on their ships which had been built up with high walls, and Lepanto was their first test. They had ships that were, were much, much larger than the galleys that either side was using. They put these ships out in front, uh, and they could blast with one cannon shot and sink an Ottoman galley. This was Don John's doing. What Don John realized is, uh, in those days what you did is you, had to, you would uh, ram the, sh the next ship, get stuck into it, grapple it, climb on, and then you just fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it's really infantry combat that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, what Don John realized is that if you could just, uh, what if you just fired a cannon through and sunk them instead, wouldn't that be, you know, wouldn't that work out if you had the technology? And so he, uh, he took some of the ramming mechanisms off the front of the ships and uh, put cancer, there's cannon going out the front and out the side and every which way. Uh, they, they were just going to cut through the Ottoman fleet. Uh, so there, there's superior tactics too, though, as the Turks soon found out. So the calm seas, where the calm seas come in, is that they allowed for uh, sure shooting with the cannon. If you imagine, of course, it's easier to aim even something the size of the cannon on, on, uh, on calm waters. Don John had also ordered nets to be placed along the side of the Holy League vessels. This was a four-hour battle, mind you. And so uh, when the infantry of the Ottoman Empire would, would go to come aboard and fighting hand-to-hand, -hand, uh, they quickly found themselves trapped in the nets. What they also found out is that Ottoman arrows, because most of them were using crossbows, that Ottoman arrows couldn't pierce Spanish steel. So there's, there's a definite technological capability here that the Holy League had that the Ottoman Empire didn't have. And on land, that always didn't matter, because you maybe got 100,000 men going against 25,000. But it seems to have mattered at, at, at Lepanto. But still, the infantry did fight. And as I said earlier, Don John went straight for uh, Ali's ship, grappled it, tried three times to board it, but was not successful, but very bloody fighting. But fairly quickly, it was obvious to all that this was, this was a Christian victory. Later, the Ottoman would say that they just shaved our beard. Uh, but that's the kind of thing you would say if, if, if you lose, which reminds me. Uh, um, in your prayers, pray for uh, the University of Tennessee. Tomorrow, they're, they're, uh, on Saturday, they're facing Georgia, and they never win. <laughs> uh, just, just as a favor to me, because this was free of charge tomorrow, right? So, uh, if you could do that for me. So fairly quickly, it's obvious this is a Christian victory. The Christian allies lost 15 ships, 8,000 dead. Cervantes was among the, the wounded. He lost his, his left arm, crippled his left arm, lost the use of it. Chesterton later wrote this of Cervantes. He said, quote, having another arm left, he went home and wrote Don Quixote. <laughs> <laughs> In which he ridiculed romance and pointed out the grave improbability of people having any adventures. <laughs> The Turkish fleet was almost entirely destroyed or incapacitated. Now, they lost 15 ships, but 190 ships were captured and then scuttled. 30,000 men were killed, 8,000 taken as prisoners, and then 12,000 Christian uh, slaves were freed by, by the Holy League, the rowers on the, on the ships. Ali escaped, but a lot of his men were left floating in the water. Uh, and a storm blew, uh, blew, uh, blew up shortly after this and drowned many of them, but there are reliable reports that indicate Christian massacres of Ottoman prisoners and retribution for the Turkish atrocities that I mentioned earlier. So this was the Battle of Lepanto. Lepanto was the first major Ottoman defeat by the Christian powers. 
It ended the myth of Ottoman invincibility, even as the first, well, the first siege of Vienna, maybe we could say that ended the myth of that on land, this ends it on sea. More important in terms of impacting world history, though, this, this is the turning point. Because this, what proved to be a failed Ottoman quest for Mediterranean supremacy, which would have shortly thereafter led to the conquest of Rome, is turned back at Lepanto. So it's, it's just the kind of thing, just the kind of real world event uh, that the mind of a poet or artist, and artists did a lot of work on this, painters, uh, would take and try to see it subspecie attorney times. Try to see what is, what is the transcendent meaning of this. Uh, beyond just the battle and the blood and the gore and, and the ugliness of people killing people. Will this mark the beginning of the end of the Ottoman power in general? And the, the, the fact is that empires that do not create wealth, but only steal that of others, are doomed to die unless they continually expand the range of their depredations. I mean, that's what happened to Rome, right? You get so big, where's your wealth coming from? You've got you to take it from others, so you've got to keep getting bigger. But you can't keep doing that all the time. That's what happens to the Ottoman Empire. So with nowhere to go, the Ottoman Empire, starting on that date, began its slow road to dissolution uh, in the Great War, in World War I. Well, in the meantime, Pius V. Pius V in 1572, named October 7th the Feast of Our Lady of Victory, in gratitude for God saving his church and for saving Christendom against the Turks. Honoring Our Lady of Victory actually dated back to an earlier period, that is the French wars against the Albigensian heretics, a French victory in the 13th century. Uh, so devotion to Our Lady of Victory actually dated prior to this, uh, but that would be October 7th. It's the next year, 1573, a new pope, Gregory the 13th. I'm not sure what was on Gregory's mind. Uh, it, it may be that you didn't want a feast day named after or somehow honoring uh, a, a battlefield victory. I'm not sure. It would be hard to imagine Pope Francis adding a feast day such as this to the, to the calendar. So it's Gregory the 13th that changed the feast and called it Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. But proclaimed that it should still be celebrated on the anniversary of, of the Battle of Lepanto. And Clement XI later declared this to be a feast for the uh, universal to the Latin church. And so Christendom, caught in a centuries-long Islamic pincer movement, first by Arab Muslims in the west, and now by Turkish Muslims to the east, turned the tide and they turned it at Lepanto. And they did so through the remarkable courage and leadership of, of Don Juan of Austria and the fortitude of Pope St. Pius V. Just, just two men. Don John took his uh, earnings from this, victory bonus, <coughs> cut, whatever you like to call it, his victory money, and donated it to the poor and uh, the men who had been wounded in his fleet and said he counted the defense of uh, Christendom reward enough. And I, I think it's, it's that chivalry, and that's what uh, Chesterton calls it when he's writing about his, his poem. It's that chivalry, I think, and not the bloodshed that captured the imagination, the Catholic imagination of G.K. Chesterton, who lived well over 300 years after the epic battle, but saw something he admired in the unified defense of Christendom, and something very, very sad, and the disunity within Christendom. And so that's, that's where I'd like to close. And I think somebody will, uh, Mark will come up and introduce Steve Ayers. I'd like to close there and thank you for listening to the, the history part. Uh, and now we're going to have the Chesterton part. And that's the better part. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Steve Ayers, who's going to come up. He's going to talk a little bit about Chesterton, and he's going to recite uh, the poem Lepanto, which is fantastic. Um, Steve graduated uh, from St. Martin's College. He did his graduate work at Regent College in Vancouver and Columbia University. Uh, he's been working in publishing for 25 years, over 25 years? Just um, under 20. Just under <laughs> 20. Uh, before that, he sold rare and antiquarian books in Chicago and New York City. 
Um, and I'd like to talk to him more about this. He's been reading Chesterton for over 40 years. So please welcome Steve Biggers. Thank you. What a, what a privilege. I've been reading Chesterton for 40 years, but not 40 years straight. I've, been, I've had my stupid seasons in life where I've put him aside, but it's always wise to pick up Chesterton. I, I, um, I want to begin with um, just a few comments about Chesterton by way of introduction for those among us who know little or nothing about him. The Englishman Gilbert Keith Chesterton, more commonly known as G.K., was born in 1874 and died in 1936. He wrote over a hundred books across a wide range of genres and subjects. <clears throat> Essays, novels, literary criticism, history, philosophy, theology, political theory, and poetry. He called himself a journalist and didn't care in the least, he said, if any of his work survived him. At the height of his career, it's been estimated that he wrote about 10,000 words a week. He would dictate much of it. And there's a story that at least once he uh, dictated a book to his secretary, Dorothy Collins, while at the same time sitting at a table and writing another one. <laughs> <clears throat> he was a colossal genius, colossal in form as much as content. He was a huge man, weighing at his heaviest between 350 and 400 pounds. He didn't attend university except for a few extension courses. He studied art. And years later, he famously teamed up with his friend and ally, Hilaire Belloc, to create those masterpieces George Bernard Shaw dubbed Chester Belloc's, in which Belloc could write the story and Chesterton would illustrate it. Or sometimes Chesterton would draw pictures first, and then Belloc would write a story to match the pictures. It's hard to summarize succinctly Chesterton's achievement, but it's fun to imagine the splash he made when he first came onto the scene around 1900. He published essays in newspapers with titles such as In Defense of Penny Dreadfuls, In Defense of Skeletons, In Defense of Baby Worship, In Defense of Ugly Things. <laughs> and people were struck by his genius. Comic genius, yes, but also by something more. Who is this Chesterton fellow, they asked. Where did he come from? Why is he apparently so happy, and how can he be having so much fun? It was a particularly dark and humorless era. The expectation 50 years earlier of great human achievement and flourishing ushered in by modern science wasn't materializing. And among intellectuals and writers, there was a general loss of high spirits and laughter. And then along comes Chesterton, who, said Dorothy L. Says, dropped on the scene like a beneficent bomb. <laughs> and with a freshness and wit and originality, attempted single-handedly to dispel discontent and despair, and turned the tables of laughter on the skeptics and exposed what he believed to be the lunacy of what passed for sanity. Even Kafka, I just came across this, commented, he is so gay that one might almost believe he had found God. <laughs> His admirers have been many and varied, uh, sometimes surprising, W.H. Auden, Graham Greene, Yvonne Waugh, Malcolm Muggeridge, Marshall McLuhan, Ronald Knox, C.S. Lewis, George Orwell, Gary Wills, Anthony Burgess, V.S. Pritchett, Dorothy L. Sayers, the great uh, Borges, uh, Neil Gaiman, to name a few. So what is it about Chesterton that caught their attention then and demands our attention today? Hugh Kenner says it this way, quote, Chesterton is not so much great because of his published achievement as great because he is right. I do more than praise what he wrote. I praise what he knew. His special gift was his metaphysical intuition of being. His special triumph was his exploitation of paradox to embody that intuition." End quote. It would be too much to unpack this here, but you'd be on the right track if you were to think in terms of the sacramental imagination, the idea that God saves the world through the stuff of the world. Chesterton saw the world as sacrament the world as a window into transcendent truth and love. That's why wonder is the proper spiritual and intellectual posture. And it's that quality of wonder that characterizes everything Chesterton wrote, and why he was such a jolt to an otherwise listless world. Christianity is not dull, but brilliant. It isn't an unintelligent thing, but preeminently wise. Truth, says Chesterton, is a continually surprising thing, and surprise is useful to recover the sense of wonder 
in the romantic frame of mind. Chesterton's use of paradox, unlike that of Oscar Wilde and George Bernard Shaw, was more than a comic device. It carried a metaphysical insight. Every Chesterton enthusiast has a, 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 their list of favorite books. Orthodoxy should be high on anyone's list, but it's not an easy book. I was introduced to Chesterton as a young man by two titles I just happened to find in a secondhand bookstore. The novel The Man Who Was Thursday, and what I still think to be his best single volume of essays, uh, Tremendous Trifles. I remember the shock and the thrill of reading this fellow for the first time. It turned the world upside down for me, and as Chesterton says elsewhere, that's perhaps the best perspective from which to really see the world. His book, The Everlasting Man, is a masterpiece and is said by C.S. Lewis to have had a critical role in his eventual conversion to Christianity. And I'm impressed to hear, by the way, um, that The Everlasting Man is required reading in the Catholic Studies program at Aquinas College. I think that's, that's excellent. There are many, too many titles to name. This isn't to say that all of his books were equally good. I mean, he wrote thousands of essays that have yet to be collected. But they're all marked by genius. But perhaps the best and final thing to say about this brilliant and kind and good man is to remark on the frequency that's been said, I owe my conversion to him. Let me say a few words about Chesterton the poet. <clears throat> was Chesterton a great poet? Chesterton was as good a poet as he wanted to be. <laughs> it's telling that he once needled George Bernard Shaw in the book that he wrote on Shaw. In fact, Shaw said it was the best thing he had ever provoked. <laughs> but he once needled George Bernard Shaw for failing to inspire that poetry that was only a little less noble than prayer, war songs, drinking songs, and love songs. He was a democratic poet. He wanted his poems to be immediately understood by everybody. He was essentially a public poet. He wasn't interested in writing about his private moods and broodings. I think if you were to have called him a balladeer instead of a poet to his face, he would have been content. His ideal would be for his poems to be sung in pubs and shouted by troops in war. As indeed the poem Lepanto was, according to the Scottish writer John Buchan, who wrote to Chesterton from the trenches in 1915 to tell him so. Chesterton had long been moved by the image of the minstrel throwing his sword in the air in front of the Norman army at the Battle of Hastings while singing the song of Roland. This, thought Chesterton, is what Christian men did. They faced down death with song. For he that will lose his life, the same will save it. This is the principle of Christian courage. He must desire life like water, said Chesterton, and yet drink death like wine. Christian courage is an obvious theme in Lepanto. It was written in 1911, some 11 years before he converted to Roman Catholicism, by the way. But this poem isn't simply a lyrical account of Chesterton's sense of history. It's a Christian and supernatural explanation of a clash of rival religious claims. He includes, as principalities and powers, the figures of Mohammed and St. Michael the Archangel to indicate the source and cosmic reach of the poem's action. The poem is written in seven blocks. The first sets forth the problem, so to speak. The Sultan is threatening the Italian uh, city and papal states, including Rome, and Pope Pius V's call for Christian arms is apparently ignored. Uh, the second block, we're introduced to the last night of Europe, Don John of Austria. The third block introduces us to Mohammed, or Mahound, uh, who is calling all evil spirits to mobilize against the Christian warriors. The fourth block introduces St. Michael, who looks to northern Europe but finds no response because of Christian killing Christian during the Protestant Reformation. The fifth block tells us about King Philip II of Spain, whom Chesterton portrays as decadent and, and weak. And John reminded me uh, uh, earlier that uh, probably rooted in an Englishman's deep antipathy towards uh, a man who attempted uh, to, with the Spanish Armada to invade England. The sixth tells of the Pope's premonition of victory at prayer in his chapel the day before the battle commenced and describes the horrible condition of the Christian slaves in the Turkish boats and then finishes with Don John's victory. And the seventh block is a, a lovely, I think, afterward with the author Cervantes, who fought and was wounded gazing at the countryside and imagining, quote, a lean and foolish night, a clear allusion to Don Quixote. One further note to make this more understandable as you hear it. Chesterton weaves two narratives throughout this poem. While he introduces Muhammad, for instance, uh, he interjects a line in italics and parentheses indicating the progress of Don John on his way to battle. 
So I'll try to indicate uh, uh, this by dropping my voice a little when, I, when reading the parenthetical lines. So let me have a drink of water first. <coughs> I should say I, I, I believe in the deflated form of reading poetry, that is the, uh, the reader should be deflated so that the poem can make its own music, so this will not be a dramatic reading. <clears throat> Lepanto by G.K. Chesterton. White fonts falling in the courts of the sun, and the soldan of Byzantium is smiling as they run. There is laughter like the fountains in that face of all men feared. It stirs the forest darkness, the darkness of his beard. It curls the blood-red crescent, the crescent of his lips. For the inmost sea of all the earth is shaken with his ships. They have dared the white republics up the capes of Italy. They have dashed the Adriatic round the line of the sea. And the Pope has cast his arms abroad for agony and loss and called the kings of Christendom for swords about the cross. The cold queen of England is looking in the glass and the shadow of the Valois is yawning at the mass. From evening isles fantastical rings faint the Spanish gun, and the Lord upon the golden horn is laughing in the sun. Dim drums throbbing in the hills half heard, where only on a nameless throne a crownless prince has stirred, where, risen from a doubtful seat and half attainted stall, the last knight of Europe takes weapons from the wall, the last and lingering troubadour to whom the bird has sung that once went singing southward when all the world was young. And that enormous silence, tiny and unafraid, comes up along a winding road the noise of the crusade. Strong dawns groaning as the guns boom far. Don John of Austria is going to the war. Stiff legs straining in the night blast cold and the gloom black purple and the glint old gold torchlight crimson on the copper kettle drums, then the tuckets, then the trumpets, then the cannon, and he comes. Don John laughing in the brave beard curled, spurning of his stirrups like the thrones of all the world, holding his head up for a flag of all the free. Love light of Spain, hurrah, death light of Africa. Don John of Austria is riding to the sea. Mahound is in his paradise above the evening star, Don John of Austria is going to the war. He moves a mighty turban on the timeless hoary's knees, his turban that is woven of the sunset and the seas. He shakes the peacock gardens as he rises from his ease, and he strides among the treetops and is taller than the trees, and his voice through all the garden is a thunder sent to bring black Azrael and Ariel and Amun on the wing. Giants and the genii, multiplex of wing and eye, whose strong obedience broke the sky when Solomon was king. They rush in red and purple from the red clouds of the morn, from temples where the yellow gods shut up their eyes in scorn. They rise in green robes roaring from the green hells of the sea, where fallen skies and evil hues and eyeless creatures be. On them the sea valves cluster and the gray sea forests curl, splashed with a splendid sickness, the sickness of the pearl. They swell and sapphire smoke out of the blue cracks of the ground. They gather and they wonder and give worship to Mahound. And he saith, break up the mountains where the hermit folk can hide and sift the red and silver sands lest bone of saint abide and chase the jowers flying night and day and not giving rest for that which was our trouble comes again out of the west. We have set the seal of Solomon on all things under sun of knowledge and of sorrow and endurance of things done. But a noise is in the mountains, in the mountains, and I know the voice that shook our palaces 400 years ago. It is he that saith not Kismet. It is he that knows not fate. It is Richard. It is Raymond. It is Godfrey in the gate. It is he whose loss is laughter when he counts the wager worth. Put down your feet upon him that our peace be on the earth. For he heard drums groaning, and he heard a gun's jar. Don John of Austria is going to the war. Sudden and still, hurrah, bolt from Iberia. Don John of Austria is gone by Alcalar. 
St. Michael's on his mountain in the sea roads of the north, Don John of Austria is girt and going forth. Where the gray seas glitter and the sharp tides shift and the sea folk labor and the red sails lift, he shakes his lance of iron and he claps his wings of stone. The noise is gone through Normandy, the noise is gone alone. The north is full of tangled things and texts and aching eyes and dead is all the innocence of anger and surprise and Christian killeth Christian in a narrow, dusty room. And Christian dreadeth Christ that hath a newer face of doom. And Christian hateth Mary that God kissed in Galilee. But Don John of Austria is riding to the sea. Don John calling through the blast and the eclipse, crying with the trumpet, with the trumpet of his lips. Trumpet that saith, ha, domino gloria, Don John of Austria is shouting to the ships. King Philip's in his closet with the fleece about his neck. Don John of Austria is armed upon the deck. The walls are hung with velvet that is black and soft as sin, and little dwarfs creep out of it and little dwarfs creep in. He holds a crystal file that has colors like the moon. He touches and it tingles and he trembles very soon. And his face is as a fungus of a leprous white and gray, like plants in the high houses that are shuttered from the day. And death is in the fire, and the end of noble work. But Don John of Austria has fired upon the Turk. Don John's hunting, and his hounds have bayed. Booms away past Italy the rumor of his raid. Gun upon gun, ha, ha, gun upon gun, hurrah. Don John of Austria has loosed the cannonade. The Pope was in his chapel before day or battle broke. Don John of Austria is hidden in the smoke. The hidden room in man's house where God sits all the year, the secret window whence the world looks small and very dear. He sees as in a mirror on the monstrous twilight sea the crescent of his cruel ships whose name is mystery. They fling great shadows forwards, making cross and castle dark. They veil the plumed lions on the galleys of St. Mark. And above the ships are palaces of brown, black-bearded chiefs. And below the ships are prisons where with multitudinous griefs, Christian, captive, sick and sunless, all the laboring race repines like a race in sunken cities, like a nation in the mines. They are lost like slaves that swat, and in the skies of morning hung the stairways of the tallest gods when tyranny was young. They are countless, voiceless, hopeless as those fallen or fleeing on before the high king's horses in the granite of Babylon. And many a one goes witless in his quiet room in hell, where a yellow face looks inward through the lattice of his cell, and he finds his God forgotten, and he seeks no more sign. But Don John of Austria has burst the battle line. Don John pounding from the slaughter-painted poop, purpling all the ocean like a bloody pirate's sloop, scarlet running over on the silvers and the golds, breaking of the hatches up and bursting of the holds, thronging of the thousands up that labor under sea, white for bliss and blind for sun and stunned for liberty. Viva Hispania, Domino Gloria, Don John of Austria has set his people free. Cervantes on his galley sets the sword back in the sheath. Don John of Austria rides homeward with a wreath. And he sees across a weary land a straggling road in Spain, up which a lean and foolish knight forever rides in vain. And he smiles, but not as sultans smile, and settles back his blade. But Don John of Austria rides home from the crusade. <laughs>